Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this beautiful Sabbath morning. It's a brisk one and cold, but reminds us of uh, fall is here and the beauty that comes with this season as well. Would you please join me in our responsive call to worship? Our eyes are heavy. Our hope is soaring. We wait in the marketplace. Our, Our God, God is gracious. Our feet are tired. Our expectations rise. We are hired first. Our, Our God, God is merciful. merciful. Our backs are sore. Our spirits are low. We are paid last. Our, Our God, God is slow to anger. Our tempers flare. Our anger rages. We take what belongs to us. Our God abounds in steadfast love. Please join me in the unison prayer of invocation. Call all the laborers, O God. Call your laborers who woke early. Call your laborers who came late. Call your laborers who feel wronged. Call your laborers who feel overlooked. Call your laborers who have no employment. Call your laborers who can't feed their children with this wage. Call your laborers who know they are working in your fields. Call your laborers who use their wage to increase your love. Call all your laborers, O oh God. Tell us to roll up our sleeves, for we know that we have work to do. Let us find you and the work we share here and now. In Christ's presence we pray, as we have been taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn this morning is a cute little tune. I picked this because of the lyrics, uh, but the tune is pretty simple. So I ask that you would uh, listen to Grace play it once through and then we will sing it together. Thank you. 
scripture reading this morning comes from Philippians 1 verses 21 through 30 and I've chosen the translation from the message today. Paul is speaking from jail in Rome in a letter to the church at Philippi. So how am I to respond? I've decided that I really don't care about their motives whether mixed, bad, or indifferent. Every time one of them opens his mouth, Christ is proclaimed. So I just cheer them on. And I'm going to keep that celebration going because I know how it's going to turn out. Through your faithful prayers and the generous response of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, everything he wants to do in and through me will be done. I can hardly wait to continue on my course. I don't expect to be embarrassed in the least. On the contrary, everything happening to me in this jail only serves to make Christ more accurately known, regardless of whether I live or die. They didn't shut me up. They gave me a pulpit. Alive, I'm Christ's messenger. Dead, I'm his bounty. Life versus even more life. I can't lose. As long as I'm alive in this body, there is good work for me to do. If I had to choose right now, I'd hardly know which I would choose. Hard choice. The desire to break camp here and be with Christ is powerful. Some days I can think of nothing better. But most days, because of what you are doing through, I am sure that it's better for me to stick it out here. So I plan to be around a while, companion to you as your growth and joy in this life of trusting God continues. You can start looking forward to a great reunion when I come visit you again. We'll be praising Christ, enjoying each other. Meanwhile, live in such a way that you are a credit to the message of Christ. Let nothing in your conduct hang on whether I come or not. Let conduct it must, must be the same, whether I show up to see things for myself or hear it from a distance. Stand united, singular in vision, contending for people's trust in the message, the good news, not flinching or dodging in the slightest before the opposition. Your courage and unity will show them what they're up against, defeat for them, victory for you and both because of God. There's far more to this life than trusting in Christ. There's also suffering for him. And the suffering is as much a gift as the trusting. You're involved in the same kind of struggle you saw me go through, on which you are now getting an updated report in this letter. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearing and the reading of his holy word this morning. Our invitation and call to offering begins, when our eyes are heavy, we dream of another world. When our spirits are low, we turn to each other. When our anger flares, we need each other's gifts most. We give our natural and spiritual gifts, our tithes and free will offerings to create and build God's kingdom of heaven. In our gift giving, we participate with Christ in his labors and his suffering and the taste of Calvary. The leadership of both our churches appreciate your ongoing generosity and support to God's mission. 
please join me in the unison prayer of dedication. O oh God, you have called us, your laborers, to give of our gifts. Bless these offerings so that they reflect the work of the kingdom of heaven. With Christ our servant, we pray. Amen. Our time for the young people today is called God Provides, based on the continuing story in Exodus. Today we're looking at chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. What's your favorite thing to eat? Well, I've been on a popcorn kick lately, and not just any popcorn, but Cracker Jacks, caramel popcorn. What if every morning you could open the front door of your house, walk out into your yard, and pick up your favorite food? All of it you could eat. Simple as that. Sounds like a great deal to me, doesn't it? We read in the Bible about a time when something almost exactly like that happened. Over the past weeks, we've been learning about God's people, the Israelites, who have been held as prisoners and slaves in Egypt for many years. And when they were finally freed and left Egypt with Moses, they were looking for the promised land that God had assured them of. After they had been wandering around, lost in the wilderness for a couple of months, the people started to grumble and complain against Moses and his brother Aaron. I bet you've never grumbled or complained before, right? Saying things like, it isn't fair. I don't want to do that. Why do I have to go to bed? Well, I'll tell you a secret. Even us grown-ups do our share of grumbling and complaining about things in this life. So the Israelites were grumbling and complaining to Moses and Aaron, saying, We had it better when we were in Egypt. At least we had plenty to eat. You brought us out here in the desert to starve us to death. But God heard the people complaining, and he told Moses, that in the evening he would send birds called quail to cover the camp so that the people would have meat to eat. And not only that, but in the morning, after the dew was gone, there would be manna on the ground for everyone to eat. All they had to do was to go out, pick it up, and eat it. Popcorn sort of reminds me of manna, small white flecks of bread on the ground. Now, why do you think that God did this for those grumblers and complainers? Do you think they deserved God's grace? He did it so that he, they would know that he loved them and that he would take care of them always. God hadn't brought them out of Egypt to let them starve in the desert. God was going to see to it that they made it to the land which he had promised them. Sometimes you and I grumble and complain, don't we? Even to God, maybe especially to God. We forget sometimes that God loves us and that he provides us with everything that we truly need. So instead of grumbling and complaining, we can or should say, thank you, God. So let's do that right now. Dear God, sometimes we grumble and complain. And when we do, help us to remember that every good thing we have comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a little hymn here today that um, comes with the children's message. And I thought it would make a nice little uh, congregational hymn today. So we'll listen to Grace play it, and then let's try to sing it together.
Would you please join me in our pastoral prayer this morning? Lord God, we have so much to be thankful for as we journey through this life. For your unconditional love and mercy and grace. For the bounty of our lives through relationships and material goods and the natural resources around us. For the many blessings and miracles of daily life. So often we see others as more fortunate than ourselves, as getting more for what they do, as more beloved. Teach us in your time, O oh God, how your love is much more than just fair. Teach us how it is a special caring for each and every one of us, tailored just for our own size and shape, no matter what riches others may have or how full of fame. O oh Lord, your love comes first, and so is so much better than all the world we can give us. And your abundant grace is completely unearned. We thank you for that. We thank you for providing us our daily bread that feeds us today, and for the promise of how you will spread your table for us in the promised land, and forever provide bread without price and wine without cost. We thank you for calling us to labor in your vineyard. Lord Jesus, we lift to you all the prayers of our hearts. For those on our weekly prayer list, those we have lifted up this morning, and those we keep in the quiet protectiveness of our being. We pray for this planet, Lord, the many peoples and nations and all of creation, for it is sorely damaged by our ignorance and lack of caring throughout the years. Be with those who face the devastation and ruin in their lives from the recent hurricanes, earthquakes, drought, wildfires, and other climate disasters disrupting the natural course of living and life. We ask for your healing where there can be healing. We pray for comfort and peace in times of uncertainty and grieving. We ask for strength and courage during these times of spiritual warfare. Guide and lead your children by your Holy Spirit to your hope and salvation. This, Lord Jesus, is my prayer for your people. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day, and he sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And so he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon he went out and he found still others standing in the marketplace. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Well, because no one has hired us, they answered. And he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who had been hired first, they expected to receive much more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last work in the heat of the day. Work, wait a minute. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you. 
Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave to you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The title of my message this morning is called Give Us This Day Our Daily Bread. One day a rich younger ruler enthusiastically ran up to Jesus and asked, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus answered, keep the law. I have done this since my youth, was his reply. Yes, but one thing you lack, said Jesus, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. Now we know that the young man of great wealth walked away with a heavy heart. And the master's conclusion, it will be hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were quite disturbed as they watched the dynamics of this interaction. For Jewish tradition had taught that God was, had blessed rich men especially. So in their way of thinking, if a wealthy man could not receive salvation, then how could a poor man possibly have any hope? They asked Jesus, who then can be saved? This sort of reminds me of the movie Fiddler on the Roof, where the poor Jewish milkman who lives in early 1900 Russia sings what he would do if I were a rich man. And his wife reminds him that money is a curse. So he immediately shouts up to heaven, curse me, God, curse me. Jesus had just turned away a wealthy man. And in the Jewish tradition, this just didn't make sense at all. I suspect for many in today's culture, the same could be said, considering that money appears to be the motivation and answer for just about everything. Simon Peter drew the question more clearly into focus, laid his cards on the table for all his fellow disciples and for every one of us today. He said, Lord, we gave up everything, riches and all to follow you. What then shall we have? In other words, what's in this for us, Lord? How do we stand to profit? Where's the payoff? And in response to Peter's question, Jesus told a story. He told us of the wealthy landlord who needed to bring his harvest in. And so he goes to the local marketplace and he hires his workers for the day at a fairly generous day's wage, a denarius. And then several times during the day, the landlord keeps going back and he finds more men and he tells them to go out to the vineyard to work and that he would pay them what was just and right. And even at the end of the work day, he goes out and he finds others still standing around, men that need to be hired and he takes them on. <clears throat> at the end of the day, the landlord pays off those that he's hired those that he's liberated from hunger and for want of being unemployed, starting from those hired last and progressing to the first. And, and so to each, he gives them the full wage of a denarius. To each, he gives enough money to buy them and their families their daily bread. And those hired first complain and grumble about it, claiming that they deserve much more than those who were hired last because they worked harder and longer. And we know the landlord replies to them, I'm not being unfair to you. I'm giving you what I agreed to. Take your pay and, and go and be satisfied. If I want to give to the man who was hired last, the same as I gave to you, why do you begrudge me my generosity? Don't I have a right to do what I will with my own money? The parable of Jesus must have fallen like a big thud on the ears of its listeners. 
For here, Simon Peter had asked Jesus a serious question, and in reply, he gets a story that on the surface sounds quite ludicrous. A landowner that pays equal wages for men who do not work equal hours. That's just not the American way. It runs counter to our whole system of justice and fair play. Who would work all day if you could simply wait around to the last hour and then collect a day's pay? Jesus' parable turns our whole economic system upside down. The fact is that deep within us, we all feel a bit of empathy for those grumbling first laborers. Simon Peter must have been particularly offended by the story because it's obvious who he identifies with. He sees himself as a laborer who was chosen early in the morning and worked all day. He doesn't comprehend why these Johnny-come-latelys should have preferential treatment. He's not opposed to favors being dispensed, but he simply believes that if anyone should receive them, it should be those who'd worked in the fields all day, people like himself. By telling this story, Jesus is informing Simon Peter that he will get no more reward from his discipleship than anyone else. The person who comes late is just as important as the one who comes early. There's no such thing as an ecclesiastical hierarchy. The elders need forgiveness just as much as the newest convert. I want to share a story with you. A large, prosperous downtown church had three mission churches under its care, all located in the less desirable sections of the inner city, where some outstanding cases of conversions have occurred. On the first Sunday of the new year, all the members of the mission churches come to the prestigious mother church for a combined communion service. And they all kneel side by side together at the communion rail. On one such occasion, the pastor saw a former burglar kneeling beside a judge of the Supreme Court, the same judge who had sent him to jail where he had served seven years earlier. They leaned it up against the texture oh. wall. After his release, this burglar had been converted and became a Christian worker. Yet as they knelt there, the judge and the former convict seemed not to be aware of the other. After the service, the judge was walking home with the pastor and he said, did you notice who was kneeling beside me at the communion rail this morning? And the pastor replied, yes, but I didn't know that you noticed. After a moment of silence between them, the judge said, what a miracle of grace. The pastor, nodding in agreement, said, yes, what a miracle of grace. And the judge asked, but to whom do you refer? The pastor responded, why, to the conversion of the convict. The judge said, but I was not referring to him. I was thinking of myself. The pastor, a bit surprised, replied, you were thinking of yourself, I, I don't understand. Yes, the judge replied, it didn't cost that burglar much to get converted when he came out of jail. He had nothing but a history of crime behind him. And when he saw Jesus as his savior, he knew that there was salvation and hope and joy for him. And he knew how much he needed that help. But look at me. I was taught from earliest infancy to live as a gentleman, that my word was to be my bond, that I was to say my prayers, go to church, partake of the Eucharist and so on. I went through college, took my degrees, was called to the bar and eventually became a judge. Pastor, nothing but the grace of God could have caused me to admit that I was a sinner on the same level with that burglar. It took much more grace to forgive me for all my pride and self-deception, to get me to admit that I was no better in the eyes of God than that convict that I sent to prison.
Give us this day our daily bread. Grace given freely and abundantly by God to each and every one of us, our daily bread. Well, that just doesn't seem fair. It goes against the mentality that dominates our lives. We've been taught that you only get out of something directly in proportion to what you put into it. Yet that's not what happened in Jesus' story. In our business way of thinking, the laborers who came to the field late got something for nothing. This parable challenges us not to look upon the kingdom of God or the church as a business community. Yet that's difficult for us to do because that is our point of reference. What do you think would happen if a person who is new to our church just joined this morning and I immediately suggested to the congregation that he or she be nominated as our new chairperson of the deacons or our moderator or even our treasurer? What do you think the reaction would be? Well, I think I pretty much know what the reaction would be. For even passing the reins for what one might consider the lesser tasks is almost impossible. The protest would be as loud as Simon Peter is protesting to Jesus. See, we live in a world of tenure and seniority, and it goes against our grain when we hear Jesus say, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Certainly, this was foreign to the Jewish community, for they were God's chosen people. They were the laborers who had been in the field and worked hard all day long. Of course, their real problem, and in turn, our problem, is that we really don't comprehend the nature of God's unmerited grace. A seminary professor describes an experience he had in Sunday school when he was just a boy. His teacher was trying to explain to him and his rowdy friends the meaning of grace, but she wasn't getting very far. She tried definitions and abstractions to no avail. Finally, she realized something the boys had known from the start. She wasn't connecting. She wasn't getting through to them. They didn't have the foggiest notion what she was talking about. So she took a deep breath and she tried again. Look, boys, grace is the break you get when you don't deserve it. That's the simple explanation but you won't really understand it until you experience it. See, God's grace is not based upon what is fair, but rather upon what helps us. It wasn't fair that the laborers who worked only an hour received a full day's wages, but look who they were. All day they had been in the town square and no one had chosen them for unemployment. You know, even as a young child in school, I remember feeling uncomfortable when sides had to be chosen for teams, because invariably there were a couple of kids who were always the last to be picked. And you could see the hurt and disappointment on their faces. The landowner asked of them, why are you standing idle? And their only response was because no one has hired us. They were the rejects, the bottom of the barrel. But remember what the landowner promised to all whom he had hired that day? He said, I will pay you what is right. And what he paid these last workers who were in the fields only one hour was not fair or equitable based upon our standards of hourly wage scales. But it was right because of the desperateness of their condition. God's grace isn't based upon fairness or equity, based upon what is right and what is kind and what is just in God's kingdom. Give us this day our daily bread unconditional love and acceptance given freely and abundantly by God to each 
and every one of us our daily bread. If there is any special payoff for being selected early to labor in the Lord's field, it's simply the inner satisfaction that we receive from being in God's employment. But we're so much like those all-day laborers who carried the burden in the heat of the day. Isn't that precisely how we often look upon our service in the church or, for that matter, any organization that we might belong to? Not necessarily a joy or a privilege, but a burden to carry in the heat of the day. When Simon Peter asked Jesus what they were to receive from the kingdom, I suspect he had in mind something a little more substantial than inner satisfaction. But we still have a mentality that the whole thing is unfair. And by our cultural standards, it is. But let me tell you something else that wasn't fair. It really wasn't fair that Jesus, a sinless man, go to the cross for yours and my sins. Yet that is precisely what happened. You see, we live in a world of tallies and accounts, of debts owed and debts paid. We live in a world of boundaries and schedules, spreadsheets and bookkeeping and of hourly wages. The kingdom of God is on another dimension entirely, one that turns our world upside down. But that is precisely why Jesus was so free. When he chose to go to the cross for you and for me, he didn't ask the questions that we would ask. He didn't say, do I deserve it or can, can you repay it? That's because the answer to both of those questions is emphatically no. The economics of the kingdom of God are quite unlike the economics of our world. And like Simon Peter, we sometimes bitterly complain about the unfairness of it all. We miss the point that if God had our tally book mentality and went strictly by what was fair, salvation would be out of the grasp of us all. Martin Luther wrote, this life therefore is not righteousness, but growth in righteousness. Not health, but healing. Not being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. We are not yet what we will be, but we are growing towards it. The process is not yet finished, but it is going on. This is not the end, but it is the road. All does not yet gleam in glory, but all is being purified. Give us this day our daily bread, hope and eternal life. Redemption and salvation given by God to each and every one of us without true personal cost or suffering. Our daily bread. We have a reward coming. The greatest payoff we'll ever receive, but not in this world. We're not home yet. And until that day comes, we have work to do. The harvest is great and the laborers are few. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Mahatma Gandhi said there are people in the world so hungry that God cannot appear to them except in the form of bread. Grace given freely and abundantly by God to each and every one of us unconditional love and yeah, acceptance given freely and abundantly by God to each and every one of us. Hope and eternal life, redemption and salvation given to God to each and every one of us without true personal cost or suffering. Give us this day our daily bread and let the people say, Amen.
Let us sing our closing hymn for this morning. There is a wideness in God's mercy. benediction this morning. Let us continue in our work. Let us live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let us be in one spirit, striving side by side. Let us find Christ in our struggles. Let us be surprised by the joy in our faith. Let us find you, O God, in all our work. Amen. Thank you again for joining us on this Holy Sabbath day. May you have a wonderful week filled with love and joy and peace. Amen. Hey, everybody. Happy Sunday.